sure you've already heard. It's a scientific study of fishes, um, so that's not so hard. Um, the other thing I wanted to do today, at least, is consider what it means to be a fish. And I think probably you guys have a, an image in your head of what a fish is. Um, but it's not as simple as that as, it, as, as you might expect. Okay, so if we think about what constitutes a fish, um, it's, it's really hard to define practically speaking. Um, and that's because there's a, a really extreme range of morphological features that are just basic features um, that we use to describe animals particularly. All right, so some fish don't have jaws that move. Others obviously do. Right? And so it's just some basic morphological features of those animals that we call fish are so widely variable, they don't fit practically into a group very well. So, um, and also their ecologies are really wide ranging. Right? And so it's kind of hard to describe them practically speaking. Um, but in terms of how we categorize and classify organisms taxonomically, there's no term that does that or that includes fish and only fish and all the fish. Right? So in other words, there's no, there's no taxonomic term that is equitable to the term fish. Okay? And so, um, and, and I just recently read a book, uh, it's about a famous fish biologist, his name is, or was named is David Starr Jordan. And he is responsible for naming a large proportion of fishes, marine fishes, freshwater fishes throughout the world. Um, he is a North American entheologist. Uh, what does he, what does he do? I'm just gonna press buttons. Anyway, so the title of the book, the title of the book is Why Fish Don't Exist. Um, and so it's, it's not really about taxonomy, but it includes taxonomy because David Starr Jordan's life work was taxonomy of fishes. Um, and it turns out that only exists. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about why that's true. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, another way to describe what I just said is that there's no taxonomic term, right? And so if we think about our, our taxonomy, let's see if this works, we've got, <clears throat> Categories, if y'all remember from freshman biology, categories, which are, uh, can, can someone just describe what a category represents in, our, in taxonomy? Things that have some similar characteristics. Uh, you're close, but that's a different term. We're going to get to that other term in a minute. So we don't need to know the characteristics of anything to understand categories. I mean, it's the same with anything, not just taxonomy, but what does a category mean? A, a way of grouping things, right? So a category is kind of a, a level of classification in, in whatever it is you're doing, right? So you've got different levels. You've got broad levels and you've got very narrow levels. So in, in, our, in our living organism uh, world, the categories, the, the broad categories would be something like kingdom. All right, so that's the broad category. So what's an example of a kingdom? Animalia. Animalia. Okay, so, um, I've forgotten your first name. I know by Raylan. Raylan. Uh, so Raylan, uh, Raylan, Say, say it. Ray Lynn. Ray Lynn. Uh, use an example of a taxon. Right? So category is this. It's a level of classification. This, a named group of organisms, is a taxon. And so now we have to look at their features, and all organisms that have similar features go into that taxon, right? Because of the similar features. And so what I'm what I'm saying here is that there is no taxon that is called fish. Does that make sense? 
There is a taxon that equates to what we call birds. What is it? <laughs> Aves. That is a taxon, and it equals birds. There's also a taxon that equals. taxon that equals what we call mammals. What is it? Mammalia. Mammalia. That's the taxon that equals what we generally call mammals. There is no taxon that equals fish. And the reason why that's true is because of how these are built. Right? So that is a human endeavor, but we're trying to represent something very specific when we give a group of organisms a taxonomic name. And so the, the outcome of that is that this term, fish, doesn't have the right uh, combination of phenomena that allow us to do that. We can't take that term, fish, and make it a taxon because of how we create taxa. Okay, and so, um, and, and so the kind of the practical outcome of that is that some of the organisms that we call fish are the ancestors to organisms that we call that we don't call fish. Right? So this hypothetical ancestor that was the first fish gave rise to, through evolutionary processes, all the other fish, but also some things that we call not fish. Can, can someone tell me what the, that group of organisms refers to? Ones that evolve from a fish, but aren't fish. We've touched on a couple of them already. Would it be some of the mammal species? Not just some of the mammal species. Which ones? Just terrestrial which one? Which ones of the mammal species have a, an ancestor that was a fish? We're talking about amphibians or something? Well, I'm, we're talking, I'm focusing on mammals right now. Which of the mammal species have their ancestor as an animal that we would call a fish? Whales. Whales, too. Who else? Who else? All of them, right? All mammals come from an organism at, at some point in the evolutionary history that was a fish. Who else? Say it, Randy. Amphibians. Amphibians. Which amphibians? All, of them. All amphibians. What else? Reptiles. Reptiles. Which reptiles? All of them. What about, who else? There's one other. Terrestrial. Not just terrestrial, not ter terrestrial animals, because that includes some other things that didn't evolve from a fish ancestor. There's one other group. Was that avian birds? All right. So all those organisms evolved from an ancestor that was a fish animal, right? And so because that's true, we can't lump this fish ancestor together with all the other fish and not include everybody else, right? And so that's a problem taxonomically because we're trying to represent something very specific with our taxonomic process um, and because that's gonna allow us to get some re really good in information, right? And so that kind of leads me to the next part of this is our, is our modern taxonomic systematic system of categorizing and assigning taxa to organisms, okay? And so, there's a, you know, things that are combined here. So systematics is, or taxonomy is the, is the process of naming organisms, giving them names. Systematics includes that, but it also includes the evolutionary history of the group that we're naming. Okay, and so we're trying to put these organisms not just into groups based on what they look like, but based on their evolutionary history. Okay, and so in, in other words, if you are a member of a specific taxon, what does that represent evolutionarily speaking? 
why are all those organisms in that taxon? What's the, what's the bottom line? They're related. They're related. Why? They do the same thing. Well, not necessarily, right? So functional, functional similarities could be completely out the window. Right? And that's the importance. That's why it's so important to make this not that. Because that gives us the ability to answer questions like that. If you don't have that first, then you can't answer a bunch of other questions. All right, so that's why we're trying to do it. We're trying to get these organisms that are similar. In most cases, they're very similar appearance-wise, but sometimes not at all. Like dolphins and manatees or dolphins and elephants. They're all mammals, but they don't do the same thing at all. So we're trying to get to something specific. They're related. Raylan said exactly what is true. But what makes them related? Why are you and your siblings related to each other? Because you have a common ancestor, right? And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to establish this group is a group because all the members evolve from a common ancestor. And that now gives us an, the ability to answer questions that are related to what an organism does and evolutionary processes, adaptation. All those questions can be answered if you know what you're starting with, right? And so that's really important in terms of, of grouping organisms in, into these um, units that we call taxa. Okay, so to do that, of course, we have to have some specific um, processes that we follow. So these groups are, are based on an idea called monophyly. How many people have had, had evolutionary biology already? So, so some of you have already heard these terms. So I'll, I'll just kind of hit you again with it. So monophyly um, is, represents a, a process that ultimately includes a group of organisms. And so we, we describe that group as a monophyletic group. A monophyletic group is a group of organisms that includes the common ancestor, and of course we don't always know that, we don't know what it is, right, because this is over, you know, extensive periods of time, and so oftentimes the common ancestor, what, what happened to the common ancestor throughout extensive periods of times? What, what likely happened to this, what likely happened to the common ancestor to all fish? This extinct, right, so we don't get to see that because, you know, organisms don't persist forever, throughout history. And so most organisms are now extinct. 98% of all living organisms are now extinct. There's only a few left, right? So, and that process is gonna continue. So we don't get to see that, but hypothetically we're lumping that organism into um, the group. And then the other key part of it is it includes this common ancestor and all of the descendant groups, right? If we're gonna describe this group, then all of the organisms that evolve from that common ancestor throughout the rest of the history of that lineage is included in that group. We can make some groups based on the same concept, right? So now we've got different levels, and that's what we're doing with this category stuff, right? So kingdom, animalia. So all animals on the face of the earth evolve from a single common ancestor. And so that means that a monophyletic group that is this means that there's one first animal, every other animal that developed beyond that is in this group. But we have subgroups, right? So now we can have within Animalia, we've got a different phyla, different phyla like chordates, for example. Right? So now that's a subgroup of animals. They still all evolve from the common animal ancestor, but now it's a subgroup within that. Okay, so that's the key, right? So common ancestor, plus everybody that came after that. In other words, you can't exclude anybody. And that's where the problem lies with this. It's gonna to have to exclude some that should be included. Okay, so an example of that is birds. So birds is widely accepted as a monophyletic group. In other words, there's no animal that's close, more closely related to a bird than the, all the other birds, right? So every animal that is in that group is what we call bird. There's nothing that's you know, not more closely related to any of the birds than any of the organisms in that group. They're all each other's closest relative. We can divide that more specifically, right? You can divide that into different orders, for example. Um, 
Does anybody know any orders of birds? How many people have had ornithology? Anybody in ornithology? Raise your hand. Come on, order. Passeriformes, Passeriformes, uh, Pelicaniformes, is that, is that one? So those are orders, and so they're all birds, but that represents a smaller group that evolved from a common ancestor that, you know, that came after the first bird. And so we're just gonna follow that into its most specific form. Okay, so that's a monophyletic group, a common ancestor plus all of the descendant groups that came from that. A paraphyletic group is one that's not monophyletic, right? So we're, that's the kind of stuff that can happen when our taxonomy doesn't reflect evolutionary history of the organism, right? So a paraphyletic group is one that includes a common as ancestor and some of the descendants, but not all of them. So in other words, it's leaving some out. I'm going to look at my notes to see what comes next. That's a good one. Does that make sense so far? So monophyletic is, is a group that has one common ancestor, everybody that evolved from that. And then a paraphyletic group includes a common ancestor, some of the organisms that evolved, but not all of them. Uh, okay, so, and, that, and fish is an example of that. All right, so in other words, if we think of all the fish that you've ever heard of that are fish, some of them are more closely related to each other or, or some of them are more closely related to things that aren't fish than they are to all the other fish. All right, and so that becomes now a paraphyletic group because this term fish includes a common ancestor plus some of the organisms that descended from it, but then it excludes some that also de descended from that uh, group of organisms. And so it's not monophyletic anymore. Okay, so this is just kind of a, a depiction of that, right? And so this is this this form of representing evolutionary history is called a cladogram, and these are clades, right? So each branch is a clade, and they're arranged such that some clades are more closely related than other clades, right? And so we've got, for example, let's say we've got down, oops, we've, if we just kind of categorize these organisms. So something like an African lungfish, is that a fish? Sure, the African lungfish, it says it right there in the name. Coelacanth, uh, like a, a lobe fin fish, a coelacanth, those are all things that we call fish. Ray fin fish, these are things like bass, sunfish, all those fish, absolutely. So this is a fish, this is a fish, and hopefully you see the problem with the tax, taxonomic nature of the term fish. What's the problem? Looking at that diagram, why does it become evident that the term fish is not a monophyletic group? Some fish are more closely related to things that aren't fish than other fish. Some things, like the tetrapods, for example, right? Who, who are tetrapods? Salamanders. Salamanders, or what's the class? Amphibians. Amphibians. Reptiles. Reptiles. Mammals. Mammals. Birds, those are all tetrapods, right? And so these guys are more closely related to low fin fish or long fish or coelacanth than they are to other th all the other fish, right? And so that becomes a paraphyletic group because the common ancestor to this fish and that fish is right here, right? So this common ancestor gave rise to that fish and gave rise to that fish. And so, so far, it's okay. But the problem is, it doesn't include, the term fish doesn't include birds, right? Because it's excluding some of the, the descendants from this common ancestor. And so now that, that makes the term fish paraphyletic. It includes some of the descendants, but not all of them. Um, and so now we have to kind of, I mean, we can still have the term fish. We can say, okay, let's use fish as a taxonomic term. But now what do we have to do if we're gonna do that? Then who becomes fish? Everybody. All the vertebrates, right? Birds are fish, mammals are fish, reptiles are fish, amphibians are fish. Are you guys okay with that? I'm okay with it. Yeah, I'm okay. That sounds fine. Let's do that. So anyway, I'm gonna stop here. I think it's time to go. It's past time to go, so I'm gonna stop. Okay, well I'll I'll show you some more fish examples.